that on? Yeah. So in, what we're going to do today is, in fact, uh, somewhat go around stuff that Sasha discussed last class and today, taking some more of a slightly different perspective. Uh, the, the title of this class is The Trendy One. Implicit regularization. And I kind of hate it, but I'm going to try to make sense of uh, what does it mean and why we actually call it with a name that rather being, uh, you know, uh, that it came out in 2017, it came out more in like 1955. Um, the idea is actually pretty nice. Probably this is one of my favorite topics. I've been working on this for quite a while. And uh, if you've never seen it, it's, it's somewhat uh, pleasantly surprising. So the starting point of this conversation is somewhat really you know, attaching to the very last thing that uh, Sasha said today. Uh, there might be other ways than just doing empirical risk minimization plus optimization to build learning algorithms. Okay, So, so far, we primarily have been looking at things that looks like come up with an objective function, typically minimize the error on your data, plus some constraint. For us, constraint has always been a square norm. And then do optimization, which so far has been primarily Let me call this whole thing L hat lambda w. And then here I'm going to put L hat lambda w t. So Sasha already hinted at the fact that maybe there is another way of doing things. You pick a certain gradient, and then you don't really think about the empirical race. You just go straight to the expectation. But again, we're going to have to wait a bit to go back to this idea. For now, we just basically stick to these as what you know the main theme, which has been also a theme in the stochastic gradient. You've seen uh, Sasha introduced the uh, idea to go streaming by using Newton method uh, through Sherman Woodbury equation, then going incrementally stochastically over the data, passing over data more than once, but still some other was an empirical objective. Okay? Fair enough. So this has been what we've been doing so far. Now we're gonna question whether there are other ways to do algorithm design other than this. It's a, it's a silly question, if you want, because if you look at any book of statistics, of course, you find many other ways of doing things. For example, local methods, say a pardon window, a Nadira Watson, OK? Um, so it's admittedly silly, but it's not so silly if you go around in a you know, machine learning world, because this seems to be by far the most widespread and common way to think about things. And if one say regularization, for example, typically one think of penalizing an empirical objective either explicitly or through a constraint. To the point that one could question, is there any, any other way to build algorithm other than this? And the answer is unsurprisingly is yes. But perhaps the way we present, you know, the kind of algorithm design principle we present today is uh, uh, a bit different. So we're going to take a step back, and we're going to uh, look at least squares to begin with. And then we're going to see how the ideas from least squares might extend. We're just going to give some pointers. And the theme of today is essentially showing how Optimization by itself provides some form of regularization, provides some form of model complexity control, trading off data, fidelity of the data, and simplicity of the solution. That's the kind of overarching thing. So regularization will not be achieved by imposing constraint, but will be somewhat implicit in the way we optimize. So first, least squares. Why? Because it's easy. Okay. You have a linear system. When the number of points is bigger than the dimension, you might consider demization of least squares. When n is smaller than the dimension, then you might instead minimize the norm or square root of the norm subject to the constraint 
Okay? You can be sorry, it's off. You can be in this situation. You can be in this situation. In the end of the day, we've seen that in both cases. This essentially amount to taking what is called the pseudo inverse of the solution, okay? That's least squares, uh, ordinary least squares if you want. So, so more per row pseudo inverse in, in just four equations. So far so good? Okie doke. Now, again, I forced you not to complain, but anybody who has an idea of numerics is not gonna tell you that this is not the way you wanna do computations here. You don't wanna do this. This is what is called a direct solver. Typically, what you wanna do is an iterative solver. What is an iterative solver? Gradient descent as an example. So if you consider now least squares, and let me call this L hat W, then, least square is just going to amount to the following. OK? Just the, the gradient descent iteration, the, the vanilla gradient descent iteration of the least squares. For a suitable choice of gamma, we already know that Wt is going to converge to, say, the minimum of hell at W. OK? And we've seen, uh, uh, this, now at this point, we've seen this kind of idea in a couple of flavors. For this algorithm, we've seen that you can actually take the step size depending on what? I heard, <laughs> I heard literally. <laughs> Curve is okay, but convex is not really. It's more like curve sure. curvature. You can look at something like the curvature, the Eschen. Then you can take a constant step size. The last iterate, you get uh, nice rates. <laughs> but you can also consider more general assumptions. For example, Sasha showed you that if you just have uh, first order information, you know, a bound on the gradient, if you consider um, instead of the last iterate, the average iterate, and if you instead of consider a constant step size, you can see something that depends on the number of iterations, then it still converges. Okay, so you already have a couple of different flavors of this. But then in passing, we also see um, Newton method, which is basically rather than finding a bound on the curvature, just use the curvature. And then you can use just one step. And maybe you can go recursive, not go, out to, uh, go nuts on the number of points. But then uh, the last thing uh, you saw uh, 10 minutes ago is that rather than using the full gradient, you could use uh, a stochastic estimate of the gradient. OK? So say. You've seen a bunch of variants from an optimization point of view. Now we want to take a slightly different point of view. And we don't want to just see this as a way to optimize an objective. And notice that here I didn't add lambda. Okay? We actually want to try to give sense of the following question. If you just go in and use gradient descent only squares, you don't penalize, you don't constrain the solution in any possible way. What I mean is in any possible explicit way. So I don't add plus lambda something, and I don't say with w belonging to a constraint. Does this make sense as a way to build learning algorithm? Is this a good way to build learning algorithm? What do you think? Of course, the answer is yes. Sir. But what is your first take? Well, let's say, let's say it loud. Well, so far, we've basically been saying, this is fine. Why not? OK, this is actually a pretty neat idea. I can deal with that. And then we said, OK, but maybe if the data are noisy, we might also want to consider something like you know, approximating this with some w hat lambda, which is x transpose x plus lambda and i uh, x transpose y. OK? We said, oh, if you, if you start to have some kind of instability, then you might want to, if you have some, some noise and sampling, the condition number is bad, maybe you want to try to massage the pseudo inverse by introducing a lambda, OK? So we already saw that just least squares typically would put a bias on solution with small norm. And then if 
we assume we, we believe that in the data actually there is a lot of noise and sampling going on maybe we can pick a lambda and you know try to massage this a little bit okay so what about this this is actually something that comes out of the computer is this a good idea is it something similar to this or similar to this can we compare it in some way not obvious because we didn't make any direct specific request on that guy to we didn't tell him at first sight you should like small norms did we we didn't tell him you should go to small norm or you should actually trade off fidelity of the data with some small norm request okay because that's what we did here here we said go for small norms and here we said trade off small norm with stability okay matrix inversion with uh, uh, numerical uh, precision well one one first observation is very simple and is the following well i don't even need to write anything down. look at this it will produce iterations right where what kind of vectors you get are these generic vectors in rd this wt Will they be generic vectors in RD, or will they have some special form? Take, for example, the first iterate, take it to be 0. Then every vector you find after that is going to be of the form constant, forget it. And then you're going to have x transpose times something. How big is this vector? n by 1. Right, so we are saying that any WT is of the form, is proportional, I don't really, well, actually, I don't care, is X transpose C, okay? In other words, it's a linear combination of the input data. Okay, we've seen this and we use this as a way to actually get this kind of representer theorem or from linear to nonlinear, but that's not the point we want to make here. The point is that this is going to converge of to, to, you know, on vectors of this form, because it's, like, it's of this form. You cannot take anything. This is never going to produce iteration. It's never going to produce anything which is not this form, unless we mess around with the initialization. Why does it, is this interesting? Well, what we're trying to understand is, what is the vector that gradient descent iteration converges to? Okay? And the point is that now you can remember, what is this? <coughs> is a solution, if you consider the minimal norm solution, W dagger, well, that is exactly the point, is exactly that it is one solution to this problem, but it's the only solution that doesn't have any element in the null space of these vectors, right? You take, what is W dagger is exactly take solution of this problem, but take the only one that doesn't have any element in the null space of these so what we said is basically that W dagger is the is perpendicular to the null space of X hat. Does it make sense? Again, I'm just uh, this is just linear algebra, so I am not. Uh, I'm not making a big fuss out of this. In simple terms, it just says, pick a solution of the linear system. You can create an infinite number of solutions by adding vector that will, when, when, that when you apply x, will go to 0. So you, you pick a w that satisfies this. Now pick any other w that goes to 0. You can sum them up, and then you get another solution. Does it make sense? This is the simple layman terms. What is w dagger? Is the only one where you didn't add anything. Okay, You didn't add anything. So it's the one that is orthogonal to the set of vectors that go to zero. This is the other way of saying it. That make sense? OK, but saying this or saying that these are vectors of this form is the same thing. You're either in the null space or you're in the orthogonal of the range. OK? So these two things are completely equivalent. So requiring this or requiring this is the same thing. That make sense? What does it mean? Well. Let me write it here because it doesn't really. We so saw that the iteration of gradient descent converge to the minimal least square, but not to any minimum. 
and not to any minimizer. We actually convert to the minimal norm minimizer. And that's, that's so easy that it's not so surprising, but you have to notice once, OK? And maybe this is not the thing that you uh, first notice when you discuss with this. And so far, both in my discussion and in Sasha's discussion, we never discussed about the actual vectors that is uh, output by the iteration. We only cared about the function value. We only cared about this. Oh, so this is important, so let me write it up. All right, so how many of you knew this? So why do we care about this? It's just been a algebra effect, right? But why do we care? Well, because we were asking a second ago if gradient descent is actually a good way to solve the learning problem. And we were saying that we like biasing towards small norm solutions. And here we're finding out that that's exactly what gradient descent does. It's not just going to any minimizer. You actually go to a minimal norm minimizer. Among all the possible solutions in this space, is biased. He has a preference for solution with small norm. Or with anything which is already in the range. I mean, if it's already of this form, you're fine. If it's not of this form, because it's convex or not strongly convex, then you're going to have a potential way to get out. If the matrix is invertible, you're yet good, because essentially the null space is empty. All right, so this is the first observation, which again, I'm slowing a bit down because you say, okay, gradient descent is just not going anywhere, okay? It's just going to the small norms. Now, you can stop here and say that gradient descent regularizes according to which terminology, though. Perhaps it's worth, you know, take a minute to discuss terminology here. Typically, in, uh, I would say, machine learning, you call this a regularization algorithm, okay? And it's not so clear that you call this as a regularization algorithm. If you look at uh, the literature on signal processing, it's pretty customary and pretty normal to define the solution that are minimal norm as a regularized solution. Okay? So the term regularization, regularized solution is used for this thing. According to this way of using the term regularization, then gradient descent does regularize because it converges to a minimal norm solution. Agree? So it's going to be a thing that you, you, you can just agree about the fact that what I say makes sense because I'm telling you the meaning of a name. The name regularization, the term regularization you use for this. And if you agree that we can use this, the name regularization for this, then gradient descent regularizes because he ends up exactly landing on this solution. OK? Now, if you look at the classic literature on regularization, that has been developed primarily to solve linear system and uh, a system of you know, linear equations, then the, these guys are not called regularization. They're typical pseudo solutions, like the pseudo inverse. You don't typically call the pseudo inverse a, regulari a regularization algorithm. You just call it a pseudo solution. And the name regularization is referred to something like this. What is something like this is a sequence, a sequence of solution that converge to this, in this case, as lambda goes to 0. So it's a sequence of solutions, not one solution, but it's a sequence of solutions that converge to the right one. And the idea is that maybe in this, if the data are noisy, there is a nice choice of lambda different from 0 <coughs> that you should pick. You shouldn't go all the time with lambda equal to 0. But if the data are complicated, noisy, sampled in a random way, then maybe a lambda different from 0 would be better off. Okay. OK, so according to the signal process terminology, if we call this regularization, then gradient descent is already regularizing. Why? Because implicitly, through the way it explores the space of solution, it put the bias towards minimal norm solutions. If we go now to the terminology of uh, uh, classical regularization theory, and we call this stuff regularization, then we can ask, is gradient descent a regularization algorithm according to this? Well, I don't know. If you compare this to this, very abstractly, you could say, well, definitely gradient descent generates 
a sequence of solutions, right? That go in the right place. Pretty much the same way that Tikhonov generates a sequence of solutions that go in the right place. Here it's with respect to lambda. Here respect to the number of iterations. But is there any sense in which we can make sense, I mean, there any precise way in which you can say that this is an interesting path of possible solution? That the number of iteration, that the iterates themselves, creates an interesting set of solutions that have somewhat the properties that we like. Basically, it should be possible to take a t different from, well, here is 0, here should be infinity, when the data are noisy and samples. And what we should get is that the algorithm we are considering is more stable. Okay? Again, this is a complete analogy with Tikhonov. This is the question we are after. Is there a way to somewhat, if not proving, at least get some proper intuition that gradient descent generates a path, a sequence of solution that makes sense in the sense that there is a special value of a special iteration, a stopping time, that allow to achieve stability the same way in which taking lambda different from zero allows to get stability. Does the question make sense? Again, let me summarize what we've seen so far. We start from empirical risk and we say, OK, we do empirical risk minimization plus optimization. Now we're saying, what about just looking at optimization without any explicit constraint? We start from least squares and we discover, I mean, again, here I didn't write any actual proof because it's written in the very same definition of gradient descent. That gradient descent does not only converge, but converge to the minimum or solution. So if you're willing to call minimum or solution a regularized solution, gradient descent regularizes implicitly. It's just the dynamic of gradient descent that goes in the right place. Then we say, OK, but you can also use the word regularization for you actually consider a sequence of solution with a special parameter that we call regularization parameter to control the stability of the solution. When the parameter ceases to have any meaning, in the case of Tikhon, when it goes to 0, you go to that. But if the data are noisy, you can take a lambda different from 0. And now we ask, is gradient descent doing something similar or not? Again, is it putting explicit constraints? No. Is it penalizing? No. But is it doing something like that implicitly? Is it is somewhat hidden in the dynamic of gradient descent that it does something like that? That's a question we want to ask. Okay? And that's why you know, the word implicit is used, because it's somewhat in the optimization itself. What's your intuition? Is gradient descent going to do something Meaningful or not? So you have to look at the way gradient descent output solution at different timestamp and see how they look like. Okay? So our first intuition would be the following. Assume again here I put the linear model, but for the drawing, let me assume that you actually consider a feature map, for example, so that I can you know write no linear functions. So suppose that you have some data, OK? This is x, this is y. I fix the step size in such a way that the algorithm converges. I initialize with 0 because I'm lazy. And then I let it go. I take 10 iterations then. What is going to happen? Well, I'm going to start to fit, OK, somehow. So I start from 0. Then I start to fit. Then I take, I don't know, 10, 100 more iterations. What's going to happen? I fit more, presumably, right? Then what's going to happen? Well, at some point, if your model is rich enough, you're going to get zero error, right? You're going to fit exactly to the data. And it's nice. It's nice. And you go back to what we said is the minimum or solution. Now consider that you don't do stuff like this. Notice that typically you, you could not expect stuff like this. OK? Because gradient descent is not just going around and picking any solution that interpolates the data. You actually find a solution that interpolates the data with minimal norm. So if the minimal norm solution was good, it's going there. 
But if it was not good, it will get, you know, you get the simplest minimal noise solution according to the data. But if the data, again, are noisy or like too sparsely sampled, then you might want to finish before. Again, here, depends how much you, need, you think about this data. But if you assume that some of these variations in the data are not meaningful, then you don't want to feed them exactly. Okay? And the idea here is that perhaps the intuition is that perhaps if I get something like this, this will be a good solution. This is not an absolute statement. It's a statement conditioned on the fact that how rich is your model class and how much noisy and sample is in your data. Okay? But this is the basic intuition. Along your fitting, there could be a point where you fit just fine. And if you just go chasing smaller empirical error, you just go chase noise and outliers in your data. Does that make sense? So we could stop here and go out, OK? Because from a practical point of view, you can just go in and try to see if there are data sets, simulator or not, where you see something like this. What you should see is that if you look at training versus the number of iteration, the training should go down. And then if you look at test, you should see two situations. One situation, which is the one where the uh, pseudo inverse solution is good, where the test set essentially goes down and then plateau. OK? You plateau to the, right solu to, to the pseudo-inverse solution. It's fine. The pseudo-inverse is good, and nothing happened. Or the case where the pseudo-inverse is not so good, because there is noise, and then you get something that looks like this. OK? Again, this is training. And this is test into different situations. One where there is low noise, low sampling. And the other way, there's a lot of noise and a lot of uh, sparse sampling. OK? So that stability can hit you more. Make sense? So the question is, in some sense, if we can characterize these kind of points, the points where there is a shift in behavior in the test error, and say, well, that's where I want to stop my iteration. That's the place where I want to uh, you know, achieve the best compromise between fit and stability, OK? Either because there is a compromise or because I don't need to do any further uh, operation because I, I just got the right solution. question so far? Is it clear where we're going? Yes. 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 So the minimal norm is the only, so it, it, you agree it converges, right? So it con I mean, because we put condition that it converges, it will converge to some, uh, we're in the finite dimensional case. This is a convex problem. So under the condition that we did, it's going to converge to a vector. But there is only one vector, which is that satisfies the representer theorem asymptotically. And it's the minimal norm solution. The minimal norm solution is, by definition, the only solution of the linear system that satisfies the representer theorem. And it's orthogonal you know, to the null space of the thing. Yeah, it's the definition. So that's why I remind you, it's the definition of the minimal norm. It's the only one solution of the linear system that has this form and is orthogonal to all the zeros. OK, so if you converge it, it goes there. Does that make sense? Yeah, so that's, that's what the, the iteration, so that discussion we had about iteration. If you start from 0, so suppose that lambda is actually 0, OK? Because that's an interesting thing. I don't want to have lambda around. There is no lambda in all this story. It's important, OK? Put 
the initialization equal to zero. Then for the next over, you're going to be in the right place. Put the initialization, any vector that is already in the right place, you're good to go. What he's saying is put initialization in something which is exactly orthogonal to the vectors of this form, then you will not be able to correct for it. So you're right. So the state in this condition to either choosing the initialization zero or already in the nice form. But you know, pick any turning set points is already a good choice. Pick zero is already a good choice. That make sense? OK. So we're left with the question of, again, we're left with the question of, OK, lambda converts to this. And we can pick lambda different from zero with nazi data. Lambda t also converts to this. Can we take a t different from zero? And this drawing seems to suggest maybe yes. Maybe it could be interesting in some cases. But we want to now start to instantiate this intuition with something a bit more concrete. Okay. To do this, we actually what we're going to do is that we're going to take uh, uh, ten minutes to rewrite this and massage it until it looks almost like Tikhon of regularization. Okay. And to do this, we have to remember just one basic idea, which is the geometric series. So if you take a, a geometric series of number and you assume that this number is more than one, then how much is this? It's one minus a to the minus one, right? OK, now this is, this is uh, what we're going to need. You can, of course, can, if you take b smaller than 1, you can also rewrite this. Like this. So far so good? Now, turns out that this equation holds if you replace uh, numbers with matrices. So if you now take a matrix A and you assume that 1 minus A is invertible, and the norm of A is smaller than 1, then you can write this. We're going to take a matrix, assume that identity minus A is invertible. You need a little bit less than invertibility, but we're going to stick to it for the sake of simplicity. Then I can have that series expansion of the inverse. OK? It's a fact. This is called the Neumann series. It's a cool name. Instead of geometric, we're going to call it the Neumann series. And in this case, you have the similar thing. If b to the minus 1 exists, and if b is smaller than 1, then I can put here b. OK? Geometric series for matrices. What about we need uh, another three seconds of interlude of the series? What if I truncate the series? Well. If I truncate the series to t, in the case aj, do you remember the equation? 1 minus a to the t times 1 minus a to the minus 1. All right? If you take the same thing with the j, with b, you get 1 minus. 1 minus b to the t, b to the minus 1. And this is one, yes? Yes. Thanks. Yeah, this is it. And here I, it was already fine. Again, this is just uh, reminding what this is, OK? And again, same as before, this holds for matrices. By the way, the slides are ready. I just finished them five minutes ago, so you don't have them now, but you'll have them in half an hour. Yes? Say it again? One minus? Oh, t plus one. 
Ja. This is the, sorry, there is the right scaling, so I'm writing things. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so these are distractions. So let me kill it. This is a distraction. So let me kill it. This is not. Okay, and now you can ask, why are you telling me this? Do you know why I'm telling you this? Anybody knows why this is actually an interesting thing to understand what gradient descent does? So, you're right, you're right. So what he's saying is, the reason is that because if you look at this and you sum up what you're getting and going to the minimum or solution, but it's more than that. The way you go to the minimum or solution is through a matrix of that form, exactly of that form. So if you want to understand this iteration for least squares, <coughs> these are exactly the two equations you need. Particularly, you can get this one. So what we want to do now is to show that this can be written at iteration t exactly using this kind of expression. So the claim is actually that this can be written unrolling the iteration from step 0 to step t as the identity minus gamma 2 over n x transpose x j x transpose y. So let's read it for a minute if you've never seen it before. Let's see what I just said. I'm saying the iteration at step t plus 1 can be written essentially to do, doing what he just said, summing up all this term recursively with this expression. I'm using the fact that the step here is constant, and I just get the sum of terms that are power of this matrix. OK? Make sense? Then, of course, it makes sense to start to think about that, because that's exactly what we're getting here. We get the truncated series expansion. OK? So do you see why this is true? So I'm not going to write the proof because it's just annoying, but re reorder the term in this sum. Okay, then you get, put all the stuff with WT on the same side, then you get identity minus gamma 2N X transpose X WT. Okay, that's all the stuff with the, with the WT. And then you get plus 2 gamma over N X transpose Y. All right, now here is the proof. Proceed by induction. So assume that this is true for t. Okay. So assume that this is true for w t. Assume w hat t satisfy this. Okay. You want to show by induction that it also holds true if you do for t plus one. So you just take this expression and you plug it in here. And then you just see what happens. What's going to happen? Let me cheat. So I just took this and I plug it in there. Now, don't make me write it and just stare at it for a minute, and you see what's going to happen. 
when I take this, and now I can make it enter the sum by linearity, I'm going to raise this by 1. And then I can just rename the sum, instead of from 0 to t, from 1 to t. But then here, I have exactly the zero term. This is exactly the zero term of the sum. And so immediately, you get that this is true. OK, well, immediately you get what you wanted, which is the inductive hypothesis. <coughs> that makes sense? So I don't want to spend a lot of time on this because, again, there's nothing in it. This is just a linear algebra exercise, and it's easy. I, I, when you get to this point, you just have to finish in this calculation. You have to push in this matrix inside, and then just notice that you can rename the element of the sum and then uh, add the zero order term. OK? Because we don't really care about how you do it. It's like this, and it's very simple. The real question is, why do you care that this is true? Why is this an interesting fact? Well, this is interesting now for a number of reasons. So let's take this guy and let's work it out a bit more. So we just proved this, OK? Well, first of all, you can stop and say gradient descent is actually creating a power series, which is an approximate of something. Approximate of what? Well, let's, let, let's just read. If t is large, OK, and I take gamma in such a way that this is smaller than 1, so if I pick gamma, so that that thing is smaller than 1. And you can compare this is essentially the same as the classic curvature-based choice of the step size. Then this is almost x transpose x to the minus 1 x transpose y. I just, well, uh, yeah, OK? I just replace this sum. If t goes to infinity, this thing just becomes the inverse of this term. Right? The gamma goes away with that, and all you're left with is the inverse. So this is yet another way to say that if t is large enough, you convert to the minimal north solution, or the one given by the inverse. And again, here I'm just assuming invertibility for the sake of simplicity. OK? Is that OK? OK, but so far we only look at the case t very large, OK? in five different ways, but it's still only t very large. What about t not so large? Well, for t not so large, this expression is a little bit annoying. So let's just consider this, in this expression instead, OK? So. so let me write this as identity minus identity minus 2 gamma n x transpose x to the t. And I have x transpose x to the minus 1 x transpose y. OK? So again, I just took what I wrote there, and I plugged in x transpose x. OK? I did nothing else. So b is x transpose x. Notice that there is, again, uh, this, this 2 gamma n. OK, should be in front of this guy, but it's already in front of everybody, so it simplifies. OK, if you do the calculation, you see that this is what comes out because this uh, 2 gamma n, uh, 2 gamma over n simplifies. OK, now look at that. OK, let's look for the last time at the big T case. We choose gamma in such a way that this is 1 minus something smaller than 1, identity minus something that is dominated by the identity. So when we take large powers, these terms become negligible. Okay? And these become, again, proportional to something like this. What if you take small t? Take the easy case. Take t equal to 1. What do you get? Well, for t equal to 1, this parenthesis goes away. This identity goes away with this. 
This X transpose is going to see its inverse, and it's going to give you an identity. So if T is small, in particular T equal 1, for example, then it's going to be very close to all these things goes away. You just give a 2, a gamma n, essentially, of x transpose y. Agree? Again, here there is a t equal to 1. Identity and identity goes away. x transpose hits its inverse, gives you an identity. You're left with this, multiplying this. The 2 I don't care here, and I take it out. Agree? Fair enough. Have you ever seen something like this? Well, let's see. If you take this expression, take that expression, right? And take lambda extremely small. What'd you get? Right? What if you take lambda very big? Well, this guy won't matter, OK? And this just become an inverse, OK? So you're going to get something. I think I made a mistake in the slides. It is going to be 1 over lambda n x transpose y. Ta-da! It's magic. It's all the same. So gradient descent does a truncated power expansion that smells like Tikhonov, roughly does the same thing as Tikhonov, and it looks like the, the hunch that we had just drawing little balls and sine and cosine like stuff seems fine. Because in everything I wrote so far, lambda and t seems to play a role, which is essentially inverse proportional one to the other. L small lambda seems to be large t, and the other way around. That make sense? So this is what linear algebra says. It says, if you take t very big, you're going to take a very faithful approximation of the inverse. If that's what you want to do, do it. Because you're not going to go to any crazy solution. You're going to go to the minimum north solution. But if you care about not fully inverting the matrix because you are afraid of instability, you can either do it by Tikhonov, or you can just drop any penalization, any constraint, run an iteration, and stop at some point. That's what this seems to be saying. Answering the question you had at the beginning, is iteration creating a meaningful sequence of solution? Yes, because it's essentially just a reparameterization of what we did with Tikhonov. No. Yes, it is, right? Yeah. That's what we proved. You remember? We just took this guy when we moved it in front. Yeah, we did it a couple of classes. We just took this matrix and we shoved it in front of everybody here and switched the order of these two. No, so what she's asking is, OK, I have the sequence WT and the sequence W lambda. Are they completely equivalent? No, they're not a completely equivalent. They're very similar. They're very similar. They go to the same place. In the end, they start from basically the same place. In the middle, they have a similar path. You can actually characterize how far they are. You can take a serious expansion of Tikhonov. You can take a serious expansion of Du and do some kind of perturbation analysis of that. So they're not too far away. You can also just say, well, forget it. Let me just find statistical bounds. Let me just see exactly how the error of this with respect to my true behavior with respect to this. And you see they are almost the same. Okay, There is difference in constants, basically. Okay? So they're not exactly the same, but they behave from a statistical point of view essentially in the same way. That make sense? <coughs> so to me, this is really nice because it's somewhat an unexpected, I mean, at least for me, the first time I saw it, and every time I see it because I forget in the meantime, it's somewhat unexpected. I take gradient descent, which in my head is in the side of my brain, and then I just see that it's just an approximate inverse, which is somewhat in another side of my brain. And here they just collapse. 
And this is the magic of least squares, okay? This is not gonna be true for anything, but this gives you a nice way to think about these two things. And in some sense, it tells you how, again, a theme that I already showed, somewhat numerical stability and statistical probably completely, you know, separated from each other, they seem to be a nice interplay of stability over fitting and computation between them. One of the reasons why these is kind of ideas has become popular recently is because now all of a sudden to control the statistical accuracy of your method and the numerical complexity of your method, you have just one parameter, t. It's doing both. In what we have right there, you have lambda and then you have t. And then, you know, typically in most studies, this is a workshop in a conference and this is another workshop in a conference. Of course, you can mix it up, but here they just collapse. There is no trade-off. They're the same thing. T is just doing both things. Is at the same time how, many, how much time you're spending on a data set and how well you're going to extract information out of it. So in some sense, you have all of this sudden, you think that you can really put training time versus training and test error for some good reason, because the number of iteration, the amount of time you spend with the data, controls the complexity of your solution, the stability, the overfitting, and all that. OK? This is, why this, this is one of the reasons why, why this kind of idea uh, in recent time has become uh, uh, fashionable, because somewhat they, rather than taking a, a dichotomic point of view between statistics and computation, they have this kind of uh, they have statistics meeting computation in a nice way. There is somewhat an overlap between statistical reasoning and computational reasoning. The other reason why they became popular is essentially because the set of ideas seem to play a role in neural networks. One reason is because the trick I show you here, this, this thing here that you don't have to go all the way down to convergence, but you can stop before, is what is typically called early stopping, okay? And this is typically considered a heuristic, a hack. And this shows you that, at least in some cases, it's not really a hack. It's actually a pretty principled idea. And it's a very uh, known trick when using neural networks. Okay? You don't go all the way down, but you stop at some point before. That the reason, and I think probably uh, Tommy at least is going to touch upon this, is that when you're training large neural networks, so basically, you cannot use any of this trick because here you don't just have a linear function. But it seems that perhaps reasoning like this, this idea of the implicit bias of a gradient descent and the stability of gradient descent plays some role in understanding the way neural networks that are highly parameter over parameterized, so they have a much larger number of um, parameters than data point, can still generalize well. Okay? Again, the idea there is that even though they seem so big, in some sense, my searching mechanism, the way I optimize for a solution, SGD, is actually looking for a solution that is somewhat linear in simplicity. Maybe not as simple as the minimum L2 norm, maybe something else, but they create a path, which is a smart way to explore the solution and heading to some solution that is some small norm. Okay? What's the norm in the case of? Uh, of deep networks, and everything I just said is more of a conjecture than a proof, but I think Tommy is going to give you some insight on that, okay? But so the terms implicit regularization has been somewhat coined recently and resuscitated, not resuscitated, created from scratch, actually, for at least these two lines of reason. One, because it mixes up statistics and computation, and one is because it might give an insight on the way neural networks that are overly parameterized can work well not only on training, but also on test, essentially by the way they optimize, okay? So just, uh, just as a, a small historical fact, again, it, the term implicit regularization is very recent. The idea of creating an optimization that converts to some minimal norm is classical. And you know, the first, this morning I was looking a bit, it looks like 1951 is at least one paper that does this for linear problems, not for neural networks, for linear problems, okay? But that's a very old idea. The fact that you can build an iteration converting to a minimal norm is by no means new. And it seems to be also pretty classical, the idea that the way you build the solution in the middle has some kind of stability property. The fact that in some the path of solution you build through an iteration can actually be interesting in its own right, because it's an interesting path. Maybe not the same as Tikhonov, but interesting nonetheless. And this is, again, an idea that first century was very clear in the Russian literature and optimization in the middle of the 80s, but possibly going even before. In that context, this is called iterative regularization, okay? which seems a meaningful term iterative regularization. Now, I'm saying this because there are books about this, and there are books like 30 years old. 
and certainly they will not cover everything we do today, but at least it's good to know that you know, when you hear implicit regularization, when you hear iterative regularization, when you hear early stopping, eh, <laughs> kind of the same. Depend where you put the emphasis, asymptotically, stability, no. But if you, you know, don't look at those papers with those names, it means they're just ignoring relevant literature. Okay? Other names that are used there now are algorithmic regularization or computational regularization. Again, emphasizing that it's somewhat computation and, uh, and, uh, and algorithms here somewhat implicitly can, uh, can drive down uh, not only training, but also try to achieve good uh, performance on test. All right, so this is the name game. Now, here's a test for you for another name game. This algorithm has three different names. You can call it gradient descent, of course. You can call it Lund Weber iteration, or you can also call it L2 boosting. Which one you think is the machine learning name? <laughs> it's the same thing again. Okay, Lund Weber is the guy that did this thing for integral equation 1951. In the statistical word, machine learning word, this has been, I don't remember what was the date, I think in early 90s, this is somewhat rediscovered and restudied. Uh, it, the name was L2 boosting. And you can, if you know what boosting is, you can say, why the hell would you want to call this L2 boosting? Well, it turns out that you can, boosting is a way where you take a linear combination or a convex combination of weak classifiers. Here, the training set points will be your weak functions and the weights that you find that every iteration are somewhat your boosting-like procedure. So there is a f actually a rigorous way to show that this can be interpreted as a boosting procedure where the training set points induce function, and then you learn how to combine them, this kind of ensemble learning point of view. All right, so as far as blabbering, I think this is uh, basically it. Um, any question about this this stuff so far? Yeah. This might be a bit beyond scope, but does this connect to like weight decay in neural networks as well? Is that doing a similar idea? Uh, weight decay, as in the step size, <laughs> or? You mean putting a penalty, but the penalty disappears, kind of thing? Um, yeah. I'm not sure how it connects to it. I don't know, because weight decay, what is it used for, weight decay? For, uh, isn't it used when you do the step? I don't know, what is it used for? So I can tell you a couple of things. So, <coughs> yeah, no, maybe we can take it offline because I'm not sure I'm going to go off, uh, off path. Uh, Let's just mention, uh, so this is where the meat of this class is, OK? And this is the calculation I want to show you. Again, uh, there's nothing complicated in it, because basically what we're doing is just that first we just observe that the iteration is the uh, converging to the minimal norm. And then we just take a minute to remember what the geometric series is, and then rewrite gradient descent as a geometric series. And then we stare at it, and we just observe stuff, OK? Um, now, things you can ask is, uh, um, well, now they have this merge between statistic and optimization. What else can you do? Okay, this is cute, but it's a bit particular to least squares. What else could you do? Well, you can do a bunch of stuff actually, because one thing you could do is saying, what about other optimization techniques? For example, Newton stochastic gradient. Can I use those? What about acceleration, Adam, Momento? You know, you name it. Okay, this is just page one of the optimization book. You can say, OK, do we know what is the effect of all these optimization technique? Also, what is different from before? Well, before, the emphasis was on training. You just want to make this small. But the whole game here, this is not what you want to do. What you want to do is to go well, to be stable, to you know, conv you know, have good test error. So now the idea would be to revisit classical optimization ideas from this new perspective, where stability matters. And this is not the usual robust optimization stability. It's a bit different. And it turns out that only a certain amount of this idea has been explored. There is some, as uh, Sasha was saying, some idea of how stochastic gradient mix up with this idea. There is some understanding of some other algorithm, say um, conjugate gradient. There are studies on conjugate gradient. Nestor of acceleration, there is a little bit, uh, but not so much. Uh, but it's not so complicated, in fact, one can do it easily. And this already makes sense for least squares, right? 
you don't have to go complicated with other laws. Already for least squares, you can ask, what about acceleration? Why would you want to accelerate? If your goal is not driving the training error to zero, why would you want to accelerate, for example? Now, so novel optimization technique could be one. Another thing you can ask is, what about other loss functions? OK? Is that something we can do? Consider other loss functions. Well, that is actually not so complicated. And you can get a good feeling of how to do it and also what you can uh, prove. Turns out that right now we don't have a super sharp result on this, but at least the beginning is pretty clear. So I'm going to show you that. So the idea is that we're going to consider this loss fund, this empirical <coughs> risk. OK? So this is a, a convex loss function. I'm going to use the notation as if it was smooth. But if you're not smooth, you have to use subgradient. And then what you can do is just say, OK, wt plus 1 equal wt minus gamma, maybe t. And here, again, I just put the gradient of L at W T. OK? So just gradient descent of the unregularized objective. So same as before. OK? Again, if this is not differentiable, put the subgradient. Does this make sense or not? Well, the plot, I'm not going to do that again. You can do you know, the same. You just do the plot, and you say it gets more complicated and more complicated. So that kind of intuition that along the number of iterations, you fit more and more and more. That's fine. The fact that it converts to somewhat something in the or orthogonal of the null space, it's very easy to prove. If you take this gradient, you essentially have an X transpose matrix popping out. So that's extremely easy. Showing that it's stable, is you cannot do what I did. What I did was basically using least squares. You're just using the linearity hidden in least squares, the fact that everything is linear algebra, to get this uh, truncated power expansion. So you cannot do that. Okay? But if you want, you can do something simple, which is basically the solution at time t is going to be trivially the sum of, the, of these terms. You start from 0, and then you take this term, then you sum it up, and then you sum it up, and then you sum it up. right? So this is going to be the sum of gamma t gradient L hat wt, right? You just sum them up. Which means that if I take the norm, it's going to be something that goes as t gamma t. And if you assume that the norm of the gradient is smaller than some constant, then you get this. Agree? This is an upper bound. So you take the norm of this, you get the norm of this, you do triangle inequality, you push it in, you take the norm of the gradient, and this is what you get. Okay? Now, for sake of simplicity, assume for a minute that you choose the step size to be constant. Okay? Then this is roughly gamma t g, which means that this shows that for any loss function, the size, the, so the iterates are going to live in a ball. And the size of the ball increases with the number of steps you take. The more steps you take, the more the ball, the solution can go far away. Now, if you take the point of view of constraining the solution, this is somewhat telling you that, again, implicitly, the algorithm is constraining the ball uh, the solution to lie in a ball. So uh, again, it's not doing it before. It does it through the iteration itself. Again, here I'm assuming that uh, uh, I start from 0 for the sake of simplicity, that, that what I wrote is strictly true. OK? And again, here, you, to push it more than this, then one has to do some fancy computations. But this is so far so good. For any loss function, you can just consider the corresponding subgradient. And if you just make this observation, this gives you a feeling of the fact that somewhat the norm of the solution is going to be constrained by the number of iteration and possibly the step size. OK? So that's easy. General loss function, at least how to start, is easy. Notice that this also shows something that I'm not showing you here, but one can actually prove and quantify that I just talk about the role of the number of iterations. But this also gives you a way to understand the role of everything else that you mess around with when you do optimization. The step size. How about you do averaging or not? 
which kind of averaging you do? You do tail averaging or you do weighted averaging or uniform averaging? What about mini batch? Mini batch size and stuff like that. How is it going to affect, you know, affect not the training but the test error? Can we study that? The answer is yes. And for some loss function, for example, least squares, we start to have some understanding what's going on. But most of the questions here are open. Um, the last thing I want to mention are two more extension. One extension is what about other norms? You see here that I'm basically just considering the L2 norm. So again, it's just the, it's the, the implicit bias to L2 norm. What about I give you a different norm? I want to go towards the L1 norm, OK? Turns out that the gradient descent doesn't know that you want to go to the L1 norm. You have to somewhat change this iteration to tell the algorithm go in the right place. And things like, for those of you who know what they are, Bragman iteration, mirror descent, proximal gradient are the kind of tools that are going to be used there. So if you move to different norms, you have to move to different algorithms. I just want to steal 30 seconds from you to tell you the very last thing, which is a different perspective that is the one that is taken to study neural networks right now, is change the rule of the game. The classical rule of the game is, I give you something, tell me the algorithm. I tell you the function class, I give you the norm, tell me the algorithm. In neural networks right now, they try to reverse engineer what's going on. So they say, I give you the function class in neural network, I tell you the algorithm, SGD, and now I ask, what was the norm again? What was the norm that you were trying to you know, get to? So we don't know. And that's the kind of study that study implicit regulation for neural network. They, again, they flip the perspective and they say, I know the algorithm. I know the function class. Where am I going? In all this game, I'm saying, I know the function class. I know where I want to go. Tell me the algorithm. OK? Anyway, that's it. There is a lot of stuff, but hopefully with the slides, you can catch up. <laughs>